gonna do, we're doing something a little different today. We're gonna start with a message and then we'll go into our liturgy post message. But before we begin, I wanted to just take a moment and it was really Susie's kind of, she has this amazing spidey spiritual sense of like, can we just take a moment and again to pause and to pray about what's happening in the world? It's kind of one of those things we pray immediately when things are happening and then it sort of slides off the radar a little bit, but this is not sliding off the radar. This is escalating and so is all the rhetoric around it. And so I just thought, why don't we take a moment and I invite you, if, um, if you're not a prayer for just a moment of silence, if you are a prayer, let's just lift up the conflict in the Middle East and all of its implications Let's lift up the political season we are now entering into and all the ugliness that brings out in American people. Let's lift up the chaos that seems to be reigning everywhere um, and ask God not only um, to be present and moving and activating his people, but also to be really present with the brokenhearted and those that are grieving. So I'll give us just a few minutes of silence and then I'll pray. We'll dive into the text today. So, Father, we acknowledge your greatness and your beauty and your goodness, and we yearn to see that reflected into our world. Um, we grieve the evil in our hearts and in human hearts. We grieve the violence. We grieve the injustice. We grieve the awfulness. We grieve that we don't really, at least for me, I don't feel like I even really know what's real and what's not. And so, Lord, we ask that you would give us the mind of Jesus on these things, to care about the right things, to express ourselves in ways that bring glory and honor to you. And Lord, more deeply, we pray for peacemaking. We pray for the peacemakers, that you would raise them up and you would give them such wisdom. And Lord, you would give them courage and Lord, we do pray for shalom, and we yearn for the day that you return to put everything back to the way that you intended. But until that day, we want to be peacemakers too. And so Lord, we volunteer, however that looks, to help. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Come on in, guys. All right, so um, last week, um, if you were not here and I, I was bum I, I'm bummed, I don't see her, but we had a young lady right here who asked, who asked a brilliant question that I did not answer very clearly and that raised about 4,000 other questions on the text line. So I wanna review a little bit what we covered last week and then we're gonna dive in uh, to this week. It'll be seamless, it'll be absolutely seamless. You, you, there won't be a moment you go, okay, we're done reviewing now, because we'll all feel, because I'm a highly trained professional speaker, we'll all feel like just one big thing, but there is gonna be a little review, all right? Now, we've been looking at Genesis 1 painstakingly forever. Genesis 1 presents a creation in its uncreated state that is formless and empty. God then, through the work of his spirit, creates forms or realms or places of inhabitation. Um, uh, for the first three days. And then on the corresponding next three days, God fills those different realms with inhabitants. So what became, what was formless and empty becomes formed and full. On day four, we meet rulers above. And on day six, we talked about them, I think two or three weeks ago. And on day six, we meet rulers below. And there is a parallelism between the tasks given to the rulers above and to the rulers below in that they're each called to exercise some sort of delegated authority in their separate realms. When we get to the rulers below, we meet them first in verse 26 of Genesis 1. Then God, God said, let us make mankind, and I don't like that translation because the word just literally is the word humanity. Let us make humanity in our image and in our likeness so that they may rule. Now, 
Image and likeness, as we talked about last week, those are words that were used in the ancient Near East to talk about idol statues in temples. And so in the ancient Near East, you would go to some region that was claimed to be governed by some god, and you couldn't see the god, but what you would see are statues that would be likenesses of the god that were there, like physically embodying the god's presence and power. We looked at all of this last week. Image and likeness are words that get pulled forward through uh, the rest of the biblical story, but the an initial move is just to say that human beings are living statues that picture Yahweh's presence and character into the world. Are you with me? And that becomes so revolutionary in ancient Near Eastern thought. We'll explore that in a moment. Now, one of the things that's super interesting is, and, and, and there's a way to kind of capture this. One scholar puts it this way. Next slide, if you would. The image of God is the royal office or calling of human beings as God's representatives and agents in the world who are granted authorized power to share God's rule and administer the earth's resources and creatures. Grammatically, I really typed that sentence wrong. But that's what image of God is. It's a, roy, it's a picture of a royal office with delegated royal authority, and that's what the word rule means, all right? Now, we had a wonderful young lady in this second row ask, okay, does that mean that humans are good? And I said, yes. And then that led to a bunch of confusion about, well, then why do we need Jesus? And I was really unclear about that, because we do need Jesus. I want to be really clear about that. So, does this image of God go away when human beings sin and the fall happens later in the story? Are the humans still image of God after sin? Yeah, they really are. In fact, Genesis 9 says as much. This is after the flood. Um, and this is God re-inaugurating Genesis 1 to a whole new family. And for your lifeblood... I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal. And from each human being too, I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. Why? For in the image of God, God has made humanity. So this is post-fall, post-sin, post-flood, still made in the image of God, correct? So in that way, humans are still good. And that was the confusing part. I was using good to represent the goodness of the noun. Fire that up if you would. Image can be a noun and a verb. Image is a noun is an identity statement. We as human beings are in the image of God. And that's not affected that identity isn't affected by the fall, although our ability to image as a verb is affected by the fall. So image is a noun. Joe, you're on fire back there. Go back if you would. Image is a noun is an identity statement. I am in the image of God, simply in virtue of being human. Image means, in that case, visual representation of something, semblance, likeness, imitation. But as a part of my identity as an image, I am to image God into the world like a, a mirror would. Like if you picture an angled mirror that takes sun or light from some other source and then reflects it somewhere else, like that's the picture of image as a verb. Next slide. Image as a verb means to create a representation of, to represent symbolically, to reflect, to mirror something. So, does sin affect our image-bearing status as our identity before God? No. In that sense, we are still good. Does sin affect our ability, ability to image God well into the world? Yes. The Old Testament and Romans is full of examples where we, instead of imaging the creator, we image creation to each other. Does that make sense so far? So in one sense, human beings are still good after the fall because we're still made in the image of God. In another sense, we are in hopeless need of rescue because we do not image God as a verb into the, into the world. Does that help? 
Yeah? yeah. One scholar that Susie reminded me of, because she's brilliant, puts the distinction this way. It's the difference between bearing God's image and bearing God's name. So all of humanity was to bear God's image. But once humanity fell, God kept selecting smaller groups of human beings to bear his name and learn again what it meant to image God into the world. So the Israelites bore the name of God as covenant people, and their job was the job given to Adam and Eve to image God well into the world. Did they do that well? They did not. So Jesus shows up as someone who images God perfectly and bears God's name perfectly. And we then are invited to be people as image bearers to relearn what it means to image God well because we are now in Christ who is the perfect image of God. Are you with me? Yeah, that was, okay. We lost momentum. All right, I, I should never do this, but is there... Any question on that point? Just that point. Because I, I, it was unclear, because she was saying, yeah, we're good, right? We've been good the whole time. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're all texting in going, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're not. So this is my answer to that that I wish I would have said last week. Are you with me? Okay. Now, you're not going to notice we're going to transition into new material. Okay. This is gonna be this is gonna be so subtle, you're not even gonna notice it. Let's go back to Genesis 1 26. Let's read our text for this morning. I'm in a great mood today. You guys, this is so fun. For me, I don't know if it is for you. Then God said, Let us make humanity in our image and our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals and over the, all the creatures that move along the ground. Then there's this poetic break that in most of our English Bibles, there's a, like it's indented and it's got quotes and it's just kind of broken off. It's, this, it's a bit of Hebrew poetry. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You're like, okay, there's a bunch of weirdness going on there. But the same commission we read about in 26 is now expanded on in 28. God blessed them, said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish and the sea, the birds and the sky, and over every living creature that moves along the ground. So there are three massive points that come out of this text. Next slide, if you would, Joe. First point is that God speaks in the first person plural, which he doesn't do anywhere else. So we meet a bunch of us and ours, and we've talked about that when we talked about the rulers above. Second thing is, the image of God is associated with backward Joe. You were on fire. Image, it, no, I'm just teasing. The image is associated with the exercise of power over the non-human world. We explored that last week. This week, we're gonna look at this third point. The image is associated with the creation of humanity as male and female. So let's break that middle verse, 27, into like its poetic sort of structure. Next slide, if you would, my friend. Now, I want you to notice, Hebrew poetry operates um, on something called parallelism, where in either two lines or three lines or four lines, you say the same thing several times in different ways. So, notice on the left-hand column, God created, he created, he created. Okay, those are how the three lines start. Then notice humanity, so that's the species. Literally, that's the word Adam. The really confusing thing we'll get into in Genesis 2 is that Adam is both the word for humanity and it's the word for one dude. And so there are times when we're reading the man did something and it's not the man, it's the human who isn't gendered yet. So it's super weird, and that's just a teaser for next, next spring. But notice, humanity is defined as a him, not masculine, but singular, and a them, plural. Do you see that? So God created that singular, God created, he created, he created, and then the, the, the humanity part, the repetition is, it goes from humanity as a species 
to a singular, to a plural. Do you see this? And then notice on the right column, in his image, in the image of God, and then male and female. Now, this is a very Hebrew way of, of telling us several things that get kind of lost in the English translation. First of all, the one human species is both one and plural. It's a one made up of a plural. One hu- How many human species are there? Made up of? Male and female, a plural, correct? The second point is that male and female, because in his image, in the image of God, male and female all repeat, that one of the most crucial elements of the image of God is this dynamic between human beings being a him and a them. Now, don't read him as masculine, just read it as singular, Uh, humanity is a singular and a plural. Now, who are we going to read about later that is a singular and a plural? Right. I mean, that, so they wouldn't have had the Trinity in mind at this point, but it's not shocking when later writers go, yeah, this is what God's like too. Are you with me? So let's talk about male and female for a second. All right. There are implications, let me find my sheet. First of all, is there any hierarchy between male and female in this text? Thank you, Susie, there is not. (laughs) They're equally made in the image of God, they're equally called to rule, and they're equally called to procreate, correct? There's not one iota of hierarchy or submission. I can hear already, yeah, but isn't she a helper in Genesis 2? Oh, we'll get there. And that word helper is a word that's used of God to Israel. So it's a rescuer. So God creates a rescuer for the gendered man. We'll get to that later. (laughs) That that is actually true. And my experience as well. Um, (laughs) So there is absolutely no... No hierarchy here. The second thing is that even though the image has an important duality to it, male and female, the demand to procreate isn't part of the image. In Genesis 1.22, flip that up there if you would, Joe, God blessed the fish and the animals and said, be fruitful and increase the in number. Fill the water and the seas, let the birds increase on the earth. Do they bear the image of God? No, but they're called to procreate, correct? So the human, the call to procreate isn't what it means to be in the image of God. What it means to be in the image of God, the command that's given only to the humans is to rule. And that's important because throughout history, couples that are infertile, couples that have lost children in miscarriage, couples couples who for whatever reason have not been able to have children, have somehow felt less than, shamed, excluded from. They're somehow not fully bearing the image of God by not procreating, and that's not at all what this is saying. A lot of us will be able to procreate, but that's not part of our image-bearing function. That's just our creaturely function. The image-bearing part is the ruling part, and that's given to male and female regardless of whether or not they have kids. Are you with me? That turns out to be, that turns out to be a big point. The third thing that we see in this Genesis text is that human beings rule in community, right? It's male and female that bear the image. That that duality reflects the image in a different way than just male or just female. And I, man, we'll get into all the sexual ethics of this in Genesis 2, because there's a whole, I mean, I can just hear the questions. There's a whole bunch that plays out in Genesis 2 around this topic, all right? So if we get into questions, you're like, okay, well, what about this sexual point or this sexual point? I'm going to say we're going to get there. That, this isn't about that yet. This is about human beings being both a singular and a plural, and that God deliberates in a plural, and the results of his deliberation are a plural, and we're supposed to draw some conclusion from that. Are you with me? Now, let's talk about the word rule. All right, go to 28. 
we're on fire. We're going so fast. This is incredible. We have an hour to worship. <laughs> Genesis 1. See, it's seamless. It's seamless, my brothers and sisters. Now, notice, after we read about the singular human species being singular and plural, God blessed them and said to them, so this commission is given to the them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Oh, now let's talk about this word subdue. It's the word kibosh. Have you ever heard this word? So growing up in Ohio, Xerxes, you're going to hear this when you get there. To put the kibosh on something was to squash it. It was to like negate it. It's like, hey, mom, can I go do this? And she's like, no, I'm going to put the kibosh on that. It meant you're not going to do that. Okay? So we all knew Hebrew. We just didn't know it was Hebrew. The word here, though, the word kibosh means to bring something into subjugation. And sometimes the word has, later on in usage, is like violent connotations. It doesn't have that here, but it, it's, it's a much more active word than just, hey, I'm kind of gently gardening. It's, a, it's the word that says creation is full of potential, but it's also full of wildness, and the human image bearers are to cultivate that and direct all of that wildness towards flourishing ends. And the Bible is full of abuses of power. I mean, man, if we had time to go through Genesis, the rest of Genesis, I mean, instantly, it's like, okay, Cain murders Abel and founds a city. And in that city, we meet a guy named Lamech who murdered somebody and boasted that he would take vengeance 77 times against anybody who came after him for his murder. And then in Genesis 6, we meet these, these angelic beings that violate the distinction between angelic beings and human beings, and the earth is filled with violence. And then in 11, human beings use technology to build a name for themselves. I mean, the, the entire Bible is filled with stories of how human beings abuse power. But initially, power was a good and beautiful thing that was part of the image-bearing mandate we were given. Are you with me? And we, are, we all know what it feels like when we're around Jesus-y Jesus people who exercise power in Jesus-y ways. It's beautiful. And we're also around people who, in the name of Jesus, exercise power in non-Jesus-y ways, and we realize how ugly that turns out to be. But the exercise of power in and of itself isn't something that is to be resisted. In fact, it's the way God moves in the world. Block quote, incoming. The Imago Dei, image of God, refers to the status or office of the human race as God's authorized stewards, charged with the royal priestly vocation of representing God's rule on earth by their exercise of cultural power. Now, this has several implications. Are you with me so far? Seamless. Let's talk about the exercise of power. First of all, and, and you're going to think this is a political point, and I'm going to say this is a biblical point, and I think I'm more right than you are. <laughs> Nowhere in the Bible does it say this place is going to burn so we can treat it how we want to. When it says in Peter, the earth will be destroyed by fire, the word destroyed there means refined. And so literally this earth gets renewed into the new heaven and the new earth. But we are give, given no permission to exercise power in anything other than Jesus-like ways. Which means that in the name of profiting, in the name of our un questioned greed to pillage and rape creation and then baptize that in the name of Jesus following is utterly against the mandate we were given in Genesis 1. To care for creation, to rule over the animals, the fish, the birds. Like, I know people are so, they take environmentalism as this weird political thing. It's in literally in the first chapter of the Bible that we're to actually exercise power in ways that, that allows creation to flourish, not just some human beings. Second implication of this, and man, I can't even, 
I mean, this one's so big, I don't even know what to do with it. But the second implication, is there any command in there for human beings to rule over each other? Thanks, Susie, thank you. (laughs) Not at all. In fact, to say that every human being is made in the image of God actually delegitimizes the entire religious and um, kingly structure of the ancient Near East. I mean, it, this is so, this is this text, I've heard it so much I don't fully grasp its implications. This text sets up so much of the biblical story. Because even in God's people, we want to rule over each other. And that can be like soft through like celebrityism and we follow people that follow Jesus or it can be like, no, we really like hard authoritative pastors that tell us what's what. And it's just like, no, even the New Testament teaching on leadership straight from the words of Jesus, it's nothing like what it is that we're all familiar with. To say that everyone is in the image of God is to so delegitimatize the power project that most of us embark on, myself at the top of the list, that we're, we're bereft of even another option in our imagination because we don't know what that would look like. The third implication, and this one, this one gets sticky, but let's go, let's go here. The third implication of this, and so I'm gonna state it like really out there, and then we'll back it up a little bit. God's preferred method of acting in the world is his human beings acting. God's preferred method of acting in the world isn't acting directly into the world. It's through his image bearers that his intention is to act. A lot of us, myself top of the list, look at God's acting in the world and wonder why we don't see God more. We'll say things like, yeah, I really gave that over to God or I really surrendered that, or I'm just waiting on God to do something. And I think those are fundamental misunderstandings of how God works in the world. The picture we get of Genesis 1, and it's backed up in Genesis 2, is that the way God is sovereign in the world is through his vice regents, his image bearers. So when we meet the the human in Genesis 2, and he invites the human to name the animals, it would have been inappropriate for the human to go, well, God, what do you think I should name them? Or God, let me surrender this naming process to you. <laughs> right? Right? It was his duty to name the animals. Could God have done it better? Of course. But he doesn't, and he didn't. Even when God decided to rescue the human race, did he do it from the outside? No, he did it as a human being. That's how God works in the world. Now, obviously there are times when he steps in miraculously and pulls stuff off that there's no, we, we can't do that. We are fallen and misshapen, absolutely. But I don't know, I inherited a view of God's work in the world that made me passive. And my thought was, if God's working, that means I'm not. And if I'm working, that means God's not. And neither of those statements are true. God won't do the work for us. He always wants to do the work with us. That's what prayer is. So when you're praying, God, take this very human desire away from me, he's not gonna do that. And then we get mad. Well, God, how come I still have these feelings? Because you're a human being. God's role isn't to make us subhuman, it's to make us fully human. And part of our full humanness is participating with him in the exercise of image bearing. Does that make sense? Now, totally agree or disagree, I totally get it, and it's weird and it has really foggy implications. But if I'm just reading Genesis 1 in an ancient context, these are some of the things that are popping out. That God doesn't want puppets, he wants participants. That God doesn't want power over to be expressed in any other way than what God himself has done in his exercise of power over. He's blessed, he's invited, he's been, like even even his commands, let there be light, it's the justive tense, it's our justive mood, it's an invitation to light to come forth. 
And so that our exercise of cultural power must look like that if, it's, if we're properly bearing God's image. <sighs> now, we covered a whole heck of a lot. All right, you want to do some questions? I feel like this would be a good time. Even though none of you said yes to that, <laughs> I, I'm going to say yes to that. Is there anything in this? Th thanks, Robert. Yes. Oh, we got one in the back. Hi. Hi. Um, okay. So all of this makes sense in a way that I feel like intuitively we all, I feel like I knew intuitively, but it's not anything that I ever heard came from the Bible. <laughs> and like what everything you're saying, it's, we're so far from it. Is there anywhere in the world that's actually like practicing Christianity like this? Um, yeah, yeah. And will they let us in? <laughs> and if they won't let us in and it doesn't exist, like how do we like follow through with this and like yeah. feel like we're somewhere where a culture is heading towards this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great question. Okay. You're not saying this. But in my answer, I want to resist any impulse to think I've got it figured out better than somebody else does, right? You're not saying that at all. But my temptation is always to judge the judgers. And then I become like them when I do that. So I always want to be somebody who says, this, this scholarship has been out there for decades. This is nothing new. This is not some revolutionary new interpretation. I'm just channeling people who've been saying stuff like this forever. But we do, as Americans, come to the Bible with certain assumptions that I think themselves should be questioned by the Bible. And one of those assumptions is the Bible's only interested in what happens to my invisible soul when I die. And it's not interested in anything more than that. And so we've tried to question that a bunch by saying, well, if you actually take the story as it's coming to us, it seems like a much more faithful reading to think that what God's restoring is our humanity, which carries on into the future, but starts now. Are there, Christian, are there real Christians in the world? Absolutely. You're sitting around some of them. And how do we know? Because rarely are communities willing to sit in discomfort and weirdness and disagreement and just sit and not have to wrap it up in a pretty red bow. That's the part I love about this community is you don't all buy what I'm saying. That's fine. That's not the goal. The goal as a community is to allow ourselves to be examined by the text, not just to sit in judgment over it. And this happens here. And I'm so proud to be part of a community like that. So I think you are sitting with genuinely, genuinely Christian people. But I also think, and this is true of me, my imagination has been suffocated by, I only picture church like this. I can't picture it like anything else. And I only picture church as some small, marginalized, persecuted thing in the world instead of the robust, active, image-bearing movement we're supposed to be. So I think at the same time, things are, both things are true. I think we are surrounded by people who are genuinely and passionately pursuing Jesus of Nazareth. And we're, we're, we've inherited a culture, some of us, that has made that harder than it needed to be. And that dance of peeling off some of the cultural things from like the biblical things, that takes a long time to happen, but it's happening all over the place in our world. Now there are some parts, uh, like in the third world, in the developing world, excuse me, where creation care and um, you know, non-hierarchical leadership, I mean, those things are being practiced like crazy. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, collectivist cultures get this way more than American cultures do. Absolutely, but there's a downside to those too, right? There's abuse there as well. So the biggest thing I look for in a church, I look for several things to see if a church is healthy. One is their joy and can they laugh together, even at themselves. Number two, do therapists go to the church? And people in recovery, I mean, seriously, people who are working on being healthy have a nose for religious BS. The third thing is the church curious and not judgmental, to quote Ted Lasso. <laughs> and then is the, is the church humble enough to not have to force itself on everybody, but to invite? And this is what I see, not because we're great, there are loads of people doing it, but this is why I'm thrilled to be part of this community. Yeah. 
Got one over here, Mike. To be continued. Because you have more. I can tell. You have more. Yeah. No, that's good. Let's spread it out. Let's spread it out. I like it. Because we can go for hours. I love it. Hi, over here. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try to do the five cues. Or yes. Or whatever. Quick. Question. Creative. Clear. Clarifying. Yes. Clear. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> question. <laughs> um, disclaimer, I think that this question comes from a place of like frustration and misunderstanding of um, prayer in particular. But when you say that prayer is not for God to do the work for us in our request, but with us, I still can't really understand the role he plays within that. If it's like, is it discernment? If, if not him actually doing the thing, like why wouldn't I just ask Lauren or Brooke to do the thing that I need them to do? Maybe they don't have the human capacity to do that. But um, if God is all omnipotent, able, capable, yeah. um, why doesn't he offer more than just I'm Each with other? you? Or if I'm asking for, hey, I don't feel like this desire that I have because it makes me human can be taken from me. What do I do with it? Yes. Oh, okay. First of all, all the cues were met dramatically. Secondly, a, a really good answer would take a long time. Um, there's so many ways to go. Um, so what I, see, what I see happening, boy, I don't even know where to start. What I see happening so often uh, is God, it, it's like when God's fighting for Israel and Moses has to keep his arms up. And as long as his arms are up, they win, and when they're down, they lose. Now that seems on the face of it like the dumbest thing in the history of the world, right? Because could God win that battle? Well, yeah, absolutely. And yet, here's exhausted Moses with rocks piled under his arms having to hold his hands up the whole time. Why? Why, when they, when they, when they surround Jericho, the dumbest battle strategy in the history of the world, let's blow trumpets, Right? Why? Because they're learning two lessons. The battle is the Lord's, but he won't fight it for us. He'll fight it with us. Right? What I see when, you, when we get to Jesus and the work of the Spirit in us is that exact same dynamic. So, how do I, I, I pray ridiculously and boldly and dumb. Um, God, I pray, I mean, I pray for things that I have no business praying for as a privileged person already. And I, yet I still pray for them because I see in the Bible that kind of permission, but I don't get frustrated when God doesn't answer all of those prayers the way I want to, because I see the purpose of my praying much differently now than what I used to. The purpose of my praying before was to get God to act. The purpose of prayer now is to see where God's acting and join him there already. So, God, I'm lonely. How is God gonna answer that prayer? Is it by filling us up with a sense of his presence or is it by bringing community around us? And, I, and I, I'm, I'm more tempting to think because the only thing in Genesis 2 that's declared not good is that the, the, the human is alone. So evidently the human needs more than just God. Because the human had all of God at that point, right? And so, so I don't want to diminish God's work in the world. I just want to redefine it so that I don't sit in frustration and go, God, why aren't you acting? Because imagine if, let's, how many Christians are in the world? Two billion? Two billion? All right, well, let's imagine they pooled 10% of their wealth. Could you take care of world hunger? Yeah, well, let's say 10% of American Christians. So you don't do this. I do this. I get mad at God for not doing the things that I could do, but I don't know how or I'm, I'm scared to, and prayer for me becomes an exercise in passivity. It's like God solved the conflict in the Middle East. I don't know how to pray for that. Because the only way that's going to get solved is by human beings, or unless Jesus shows up and just says, all right, we're done here. And I can't wait for that. But until then, it seems like he's sort of waiting for us to partner with him. Now, am I even fishing remotely close to an answer to your question? 
Because right now, I am, I'm an outward processor. And so my, if I can't tell if I've answered it, I'm just going to keep talking and hope that five minutes from now, something profound will have been said. Okay, so do you have a thought back? Like, hey, this is dumb. You're just repeating the same point you made. How, you're not telling me how this works. All right, I'll answer that invisible objection. Here's the way... Here's the way I've learned to pray. And this is not for everybody. I pray the Lord's Prayer. That's how I pray anymore. I don't pray anything else. God, thank you for fathering me, parenting me. God, may your name be kept holy by me. Not just some abstract. I volunteer to be someone who keeps your name holy. May your kingdom come and may your will be done as I act into the world under your direction in the power of your spirit. Lord, would you show me what you're already doing? And may I look for partners in the cooperative working out of dominion. Like, that's how I pray now. And, and for me, it's, 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 it's radically changed how I see God working in the world. So does God act apart from humans? Well, of course. Right? The sun came up. He does miraculous things. Absolutely. But that's not his preferred method. His preferred method is to create image bearers who so know him that they exercise their own power in ways that are aligned with his. <gasps> Proctors. Oh, you guys don't even know. It's like you're looking around, and I, I see familiar faces. Some of you look excited to be here. Some of you not so much. But then you see the face of somebody that's family, you know, and friends for a long time. And I'm sorry, I just had to acknowledge it. Anyway, got emotional. Don't know why. Dumb. All right, next question. Hey, Mike. Why are you over there? Family room. Got the kiddo. Okay. Yeah. You should I be over, in, in. over here. No, right there. Yeah. You know. um, clarification on the ruling over the environment piece. Yes. There was a guy, you ever heard of a guy named Ergie Letourneau from the early 1900s? The ring a bell? No. Okay, so he was the inventor of all Unlike the Unlike large... you. I was not alive then. <laughs> okay. My wife bought his autobiography for me for five cents from McKay's, and it's one of the greatest books I've ever read. That's amazing. Um, so he invented all the large dirt moving equipment that Caterpillar uses today. He invented, he was the first one to put rubber tires on commercial equipment. Um, he, he's a believer, and he, he dedicated his entire business to this, this idea. It yeah. was his, his, I mean, he's what's responsible for the reason we have, you know, Construction equipment. Yeah. Uh, he designed all of it. That's awesome. Um, in his, his later years, he exported a lot of that equipment to Africa as part of mission work. Mm. And he gifted it to the societies in Africa and said, mm. use this to subdue your environment mm -hmm. and become what he said, civilized. He yeah. said it was a gift. Yeah. Was he wrong or was he, was he right? As he, was, that, was that living out the mission or was that um, taking liberties with the environment? Oh, that's a great question. And I don't know. <laughs> I don't have any idea. Because what, what the scripture seems to teach about technology, right? We, we, the first technological advance we read about is bricks and mortar, Tower of Babel. And then bricks and mortar are used by, by the Egyptians. They force the Israelites to use bricks and mortar to build their great cities. Never once are bricks and mortar critiqued as bad. But how they're used obviously is. So my guess would be Equipment that helps human beings build space and place, awesome. And to gift that, the only thing I wonder about is civilized. We in the West sometimes don't realize how um, much we seek to colonize, even through our technology. And so that would be the one place I'd go, ah, I'm, I wouldn't use that word, but the idea that, like, that you're gifting incredible pieces of technology so that others can better themselves, that is image bearing, absolutely. Yeah, that's great. All right, a couple more. Hey. Hi. Okay, so I'm about to kibosh this whole thing. Kibosh! <laughs> yes! Okay, so I have really enjoyed this series because in studying these pictures, I feel like almost like my innocence is restored in, in a type of way, because it's like, hey, if we never messed up, here's what the world would look like, and here's how we would participate. Um, one thing that's really cool in Jesus is we see his actions, but he's such a heavenly being, he, like, healed people and made their legs grow, and I don't know how to do that. So That's fair. <laughs> so um, 
it, I feel more ready to be a citizen of the new world, so to speak. Yeah. I, I feel more uh, like my imagination is connecting with that space. Yeah. However, while I'm still in this current world, it's really difficult to interact with this power that we have. Yeah. I almost feel like there's a peer pressure in my society and culture to be subhuman and to mm. act like this is where I belong. And if my imagination takes me to a heavenly place or a new world, it, it almost seems inappropriate to function that way because like relationships won't be together and and my flawed self has a perspective of the new world that's still inappropriate so how mm. do i mm. how do i relate to to that world and that information as if i never fell in this natural world where we obviously have fallen yes oh that's so brilliant as always okay so there are and paul uh, is all over this in the book of Ephesians. He'll say, put off your former manner of life. And he, has, he, and he uses a really interesting word there for manner of life. So there are old creation dynamics at play in this present age, right, that are passing away. Old creation dynamics like uh, oppression, injustice, uh, justice, violence, demonization, um, exclusion, shaming, there's a bunch of those. Then in Christ, and then we get in Paul's teachings to the churches, a bunch of new creation dynamics, lament, reconciliation, hospitality, and so on. And the tricky part for us is to live those new creation dynamics in the midst of the, all the old creation stuff that's going on with us. That's why when, when Christians say, yes, I'm a Christian, but I hate my neighbor, or I am violent towards others in my speech, that's why we all feel like a, a clash of, of worlds there because the one doesn't fit with the other one, correct? That part of becoming a new creation person and living into full humanity is the putting off of those things so that when I have an enemy, instead of hating that enemy, punishing that enemy, withdrawing from that enemy, I'm seeking to love them. Oh, good Lord, that is the hardest part ever. And that's where the, rule, the, the part of image bearing that is the hardest for us is how it is that I treat people who are still image bearers who don't image God the way I would want them to. Does that make sense? That becomes the hardest thing. And that's why community and corporate formation is such a big deal. That's why we tell, cel celebrate the Lord's Supper is because we're sitting around people who are still in the middle of working out, well, how does gender relate to all of this? And, and what about racism? And what about capitalism? And what about all of these things? And we're not finished products. And if there's a space, if there can be a new creation space anywhere on the planet where you don't have to have every right opinion or be fully formed into some moral perf you know, perfection, and we're allowed to sit in weakness and limitation and process together, even though we don't agree on everything, that, I think, is one of the most beautiful ways we testify that Jesus actually has defeated the powers. Does that make sense? So then, is it like we're playing chess with our power with each other in community? Because yes. it won't stop. You know what I mean? Yes, yes. Okay. So it's like, Whoa. you take a turn. Wow. <laughs> You take a turn, I take a turn, because we're all just trying to figure out what it actually is. Absolutely. Okay. And we don't know, because we've been saturated in the imagination of power. That's why, when I grew up in megachurch land, the vision of pastor was CEO. Right. right? You had to be busy, you had to be powerful, you had to be important, you had to be public. And, and I've since, thankfully, and many of us have since gone, yeah, that's really awful. What a horror, that, that's an American corruption of the vision of Christ, right? So the worst part is when the religious community gets co-opted by old creation dynamics. And then in the name of Jesus, we call that Christ following. I have way more questions because of what you just said, but I'm not going to ask them right now. <laughs> I love you. Okay. All right. You guys are awesome. We're good? We have one more. Okay. No? Sure. I mean, if you already said yes. So you Hi, Donna. Hi. Um, so you referenced two battles, the Battle of Jericho and um, the other one with Moses. Yeah. How, how do you reconcile if, if we're designed in Genesis not to subdue one another? Yeah. God takes Israel totally and good. makes this whole yes. thing to subdue, to 
the whole thing in the Old Testament. Totally, totally. The wars and the, and the rumors, I mean, all of that. Yeah. How do we reconcile that to yeah. God's image and what he wants for humanity? Oh, so good, Donna. So good. And let's, and let's make it even worse. Well, I mean, because on page two, you have one man, one woman, one lifetime. And then on page three, you have polygamy. Right? You have God saying, I'm your king, and then you have Israel saying, oh, well, we'd rather have a king, and he gives them a king, and the king's, you know, kingship is awful for Israel. And I don't know that I have a great answer on Old Testament violence, Donna. We've talked a little bit about it in the Bible series where God does seem to accommodate himself to cultural ways of understanding and living that aren't his ideal. Um, and I would argue that, that the Old Testament, and boy, this is gonna, could raise more questions, but the Old Testament is triage. Nothing in the Old Testament is God's ideal, except for Genesis 1 and 2. Everything else is triaging fallen humanity. So even when we get to the Ten Commandments, God's desire wasn't to have to say to humanity, don't murder. That is triage. Even when you get commands against, like, okay, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, that actually limits revenge, but that's not God's ideal either. So I think, I think, I, I've had to learn to reread the Old Testament not as the revelation of God's ideal, but rather evidence of triage, that the same triage he does to me when he meets me and all the awful stuff that I'm doing. Now that doesn't answer, because there are still lots of other objections to that, Don, I really wanna honor your question because it's a really good one. And, and God seems to use power over, you know, here's Ananias and Sapphira, right? And like, oh, they lied, zap. Right? Here's the poor dude trying to study the ark, and he gets electrified, you know? And it's like, huh, that feels a lot like power over. That feels a lot like violence. That might be worthy of, a, of an entire series. So I think I want to really honor that question, and I wrestle with it too. Here's what we want to do. Thank you, Donna. My goodness, you guys are amazing. We want to take the rest of our time together to um, practice corporate formation. What that means is we are going to sing, and the reason we sing is because music has a way of expressing and bypassing some of the noma modes of operation. It, has, it can get us into our hearts and not just in our heads because we've been there for a while. Music also can kind of refurbish our imagination so that we're, think, we're, we're using our voices and we're using words to do other things than like to speak down to somebody or curse somebody. Around the room, uh, he, over here, here, and in the back, we're gonna have people holding communion. Um, and you take and dip, and they will, they will you know, speak the words. Uh, and we think that's so incredibly important as human beings who are to serve one another. At the stations, we have uh, uh, pieces of paper. We have COVID cups, if you're interested in that. But we also have pieces of paper where you can write down prayer requests. And one of the things we do is every Tuesday, we pray uh, over all of those. But the reason we set this part aside, and this is so important, because so much of what church is designed to do is to keep us passive, correct? We'll talk about participation all day long, and what we mean by that is we'll just get more involved in the church. That's not what this is for. This is all team sport kind of stuff. So this is our chance to participate in the formation of what kind of community we wanna be. So to that end, Jesus, we ask your blessing. We pray that we would continue to be captured by your beauty. We thank you for your great kingdom that cannot be stopped and is not threatened by the things going on in our world. We pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit and that you would form us into people that reflect you well into the world. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen.